Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you have a fantastic Monday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is TikTok. By now, you've probably seen that it was reported over the weekend that Donald Trump told reporters as far as TikTok is concerned, we're banning them from the United States. And so the first thing I wanna touch on here is what could actually happen because there are three main options that we've seen passed around right now. The first possibility would be for Trump to direct the Commerce Department to put TikTok on what is called the entity list, which would basically block US companies from having any commercial ties with TikTok. Another possibility would be to use a law called the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, which allows a president to essentially ban any foreign communications products that are seen as a threat to US national security. That option could have a very extreme outcome according to Stuart Baker, a former National Security Agency general counsel. If Donald Trump were to use the full force of that order, no American could work for them, the app store couldn't make them available, American advertisers couldn't pay them for ads, it would be economically devastating for them. And then the third major option that we've seen being talked about is that Donald Trump could basically force TikTok's owner ByteDance to sell the app or divest from its US operations. Right, and that would be done through the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States or CFI US, which recommends to the president if acquisition should be rejected or reversed on national security grounds. And while there are a lot of different technicalities here that we will not be diving into, all you really need to know for this story is that last year, CFI US, which is chaired by Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin launched an investigation into ByteDance. According to the New York Times, a source said that as a result of the investigation, CFI US recommended that Trump order ByteDance to divest from TikTok, which once again is essentially another way of saying forcing them to sell it. But notably there, last Friday, we saw Trump saying he did not want a deal selling TikTok to a US company. And when asked if he would use the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, he said, well, I have that authority. I can do it with an executive order or that. With him also adding at that time, it's going to be signed tomorrow, which obviously did not happen. But whatever we see from Trump, Trump will be absolutely massive. And not just for TikTok, right? Very notably, Trump's announcement comes just hours after we started seeing reports that Microsoft was in talks to buy TikTok, with sources telling various outlets that the talks have been underway for some time now, with experts saying this was likely because of that CFI US investigation. And a deal between Microsoft and TikTok, which would probably be valued somewhere in the billions, I mean, it would be a huge win for both companies. For TikTok, even though it would be a concession to pressure from the Trump administration, it would still be better than the alternative, right? It would still allow them to keep the app in the United States rather than being banned and taking a huge hit in users right after it was banned in India, but it would also arguably be an even bigger win and definitely a huge step for Microsoft. You know, unlike pretty much all the other big tech companies that are their competitors, Microsoft doesn't have a social media platform or a social media company. Unless, yes, you count LinkedIn, but LinkedIn is hyper, hyper specific. So if Microsoft did acquire TikTok, not only would they just instantly have a broadly appealing social media company, they would be acquiring one of the most popular, fastest growing platforms, and that has huge implications for everyone. Right, immediately, they would become a major rival to huge platforms like Facebook, which of course also owns Instagram, as well as Google, which owns YouTube, especially because many of the tech companies that are out there, including Facebook, are trying to come up with alternatives to TikTok and are probably hoping that it gets banned. Right, so not only would Microsoft get a massive foothold in a consumer market that it hasn't been a part of before, but it would also drastically change the landscape of big tech in a fundamental way. But with this story, I mean, there, there's a lot of confusion. You have Trump's announcement. Then yesterday, you have the Wall Street Journal reporting Microsoft has now paused negotiations to buy TikTok. But then later in that same day, Microsoft publishes a blog post. And in addition to confirming for the first time that it was in talks to buy TikTok, the company also said that after talks between its CEO and Trump, Microsoft is prepared to continue discussions to explore a purchase of TikTok in the United States. And adding, Microsoft fully appreciates the importance of addressing the president's concerns. It is committed to acquiring TikTok subject to a complete security review and providing proper economic benefits to the United States, including the United States Treasury. With Microsoft also saying it will move quickly and complete the discussions no later than September 15th, and they will continue to dialogue with Trump and his administration. With that post also noting that the preliminary proposal would involve a purchase of the TikTok service in the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, and saying Microsoft may invite other American investors to be minority owners. Also, Microsoft going on to address security concerns, saying that it will add protections and ensure transparency, and adding that in addition to other measures, Microsoft would ensure that all private data of TikTok's American users is transferred to and remains in the United States. To the extent that any such data is currently stored or backed up outside the United States, Microsoft would ensure that this data is deleted from servers outside the country after it is transferred. So that seemed to indicate that Trump is at least open to these negotiations, and in fact, as we were recording today, we saw Trump addressing the issue for the first time since Friday. Here's the deal. Uh, I don't mind if, uh, whether it's Microsoft or somebody else, a big company, a secure company, very, very American company, buy it. We set a date, I set a date of around September 15th. 
at which point it's going to be out of business in the United States. Notably there, he also said for any sale, some of the money would actually have to go to the Treasury Department because they are allowing the sale to go forward. Though, he didn't explain how that would work legally. Right, so that's just a huge reversal from Trump, who literally said a few days ago that he didn't want to sell TikTok to a new company. But according to the New York Times, Trump seemed to change his mind after a series of calls, including the one with Microsoft CEO, as well as another from Senator Lindsey Graham, who tweeted out his support of the idea yesterday. With the Times also reporting that several of Trump's aides had warned that a ban could prompt an intense legal battle, as well as hurt the president's popularity with younger Americans. But still, some of the highest ranking officials in the Trump administration have argued against the sale and pushed for a much harder line against China. On Saturday, for example, you had Trump's top trade advisor, Peter Navarro, going on Fox News and really going in hard on TikTok. Every time you sign up for TikTok, all of your information is potentially going right back to the Chinese Communist Party, the Chinese military, and the Chinese government. They can use this social, these social media apps to steal your personal information, your business information, and also, Judge, they use these social media apps to track you and surveil you and monitor your movements. This is a national security threat. So here's what I would ask the American people. If they're using TikTok and they hear the president's going to basically ban that, get on the Trump train with that because that app you're using, fun as it may be, is dangerous. And also, a big thing here is that Navarro went after Microsoft. There was like a, a, a vicious leak that went out trying to push the president into a corner and said, like, Microsoft was going to buy us. Guess what about Microsoft? A couple of things. First of all, Microsoft is the software that the People's Liberation Army and Chinese government run on. Second of all, Microsoft helped China build its great firewall. And while speaking to CNN this morning, we saw Navarro double down on his remarks, again, saying that Microsoft is used by the Chinese government and that it enabled China to engage in surveillance and censorship by helping it build the firewall and adding. So the question is, is Microsoft going to be compromised? Would it be, would it yeah. be useful to have a rule if you it's sell it that it would maybe Microsoft could divest its Chinese holdings and then we well, feel it sounds more to me like you don't trust them. It's Microsoft. So this mm. is not this is not a white hat company, right? Mm. That's that's an wow. American company. It's clearly a com a multinational yeah. company that's made billions in China that 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 that, that enables Chinese censorship through things like Bing yeah. and Skype. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo also saying that he agreed with Navarro's initial remarks in an interview with Fox News yesterday. And there, notably, he also took a hard line against other Chinese tech companies as well and seemed to indicate that Trump would be taking action against more than just TikTok. These Chinese software companies doing business in the United States, whether it's TikTok or WeChat, uh, there are countless more, uh, as Peter Navarro said, are feeding data directly to the Chinese Communist Party, their national security apparatus. Could be their, their facial recognition pattern, it could be uh, information about their residents, their phone numbers, their friends, who they're connected to. President Trump has said enough and we're gonna fix it. And so uh, he will take action in the coming days with respect to a broad array of uh, national security risks that are presented by software connected to the Chinese Communist Party. But when asked if he thought that Microsoft buying TikTok would still create security concerns, he said, I, I promise you the president, when he makes his decision, uh, will make sure that everything we have done drives us as close to zero risk for the American people. But of course, Pompeo made those comments about timing before Trump made his statement today. So for right now, while a lot is still up in the air, it at least seems that there is a 45 day cushion period before any drastic actions are taken. And you know, with the fate of TikTok right now unclear, we've seen a lot of reactions from the TikTok user base. You know, we've seen some people panic, a lot of people saying, hey, be sure to follow me and anyone else that you want on all these other platforms. We saw reports of just hundreds of thousands of people signing up to TikTok competitors just in case. Right, so you had a lot of people taking the situation very seriously. You also people like uh, Claudia Conway chiming in. Yo, real Donald Trump, if you want to just ban my TikTok account, why didn't you just say so? Claudia, if you don't know, is Kellyanne Conway's daughter, who is just very, very anti-Trump, trolling him constantly, which there is also a belief among part of the TikTok base that Donald Trump is doing this not because of security reasons, but because the user base on the platform constantly trolls and mocks him. And actually, in line with this, after the news about TikTok potentially being shut down came out, we saw a lot of people complimenting Donald Trump, right, being very sarcastic, some mockingly building a wall for him. We also saw some large creators on TikTok jumping into the trend, though not really seeming to have a stance. People like Addison Rae, for example, who dropped out of Louisiana State University to become a TikToker, posting a video of herself pretending to knock on LSU's doors to let her back in. We also saw TikTok's US general manager sending out a message to the TikTok community, saying, we've heard your outpouring of support, saying, thank you, we're not planning on going anywhere. Going on to say, we are building the safest app because we know it's the right thing to do. But yeah, that's where we are with this story. It is gonna be interesting to see what happens here. My main, honestly, my main concern is with the kind of like 
mid-tier to small creator on TikTok. And a lot of the big creators on TikTok, in addition to there being an interesting crossover in the, the biggest people also being the, the people showing up going to parties during a pandemic, many of them are also so large they've been able to effectively move platforms, whether it be YouTube, Instagram, whatever. They'll be fine, but it's kind of the, the small to medium creators that you know probably failed on other platforms that all of a sudden got this big shot. They've thrown their lives into it. And all of a sudden, now it might be going away, which is why I'll repeat the, the same advice I've said for over a decade now. Constantly move your audience to, yes, other platforms, but also into more places that you control. It can be something as simple as a, a mailing list, or now you have services like Community that we use with our text line. Boom, text me here. And for most creators, you'll only be able to move a small percentage, but that is the most important percentage. Because at the end of the day, none of these platforms truly care about you as an individual creator. They're looking out for them, and then too, as we're seeing with TikTok, sometimes they're just outside things that happen and then shake up the ground. But yeah, with that said, I'd love to know your thoughts on this story. Those that do have security concerns regarding TikTok, would Microsoft buying it up kind of take away those concerns? Yes, no, why, why not? And also, any other thoughts you have regarding this story? I'd really love to hear from you in those comments down below. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today, and today in Awesome, brought to you by Robinhood, and more specifically, Robinhoodphil.com. And if you didn't know, Robinhood is a fantastic investment app for beginners and active traders with no commission fees. And when I say active, I really mean it. With Robinhood, you can buy and sell stock in real time whenever the market is open, and they even offer extended trading hours so you don't have to wait to invest. And Robinhood isn't just some random sponsor. I've actually been using and loving their app for several years now. And what's really awesome is if today you want to check this out, right? You want to see what the app looks like, see if this is for you. If you sign up using Robinhoodphil.com, right? You just click that link down below, you link your bank account, and boom, a surprise stock will appear in your account. Now, certain limitations do apply, but you don't even need money in your account to get the free stock. And while there's a good chance that the stock will have a value between $2.50 and $10, Robinhood also says that you have a 1 in 200 chance to get stocks like Microsoft, Visa, and even Johnson & Johnson. But yeah, main point, go to robinhoodphil.com or just click that link down below. You get something fantastic. Each sign up helps support the show. But yeah, uh, thank you, you're welcome, and enjoy. For today's TIA, I, I wanted to focus more on stories rather than just kind of videos. For example, this kid, Tony. His birth parents, unfortunately, horrible people. Uh, they left him literally broken, beaten, hours away from death. Luckily, little Tony gets adopted by Paula and Mark Hudgel back in 2016. Tony, unfortunately, has had to go through some serious surgeries that left him with prosthetic legs, though it has not slowed him down. In fact, on June 1st, little five-year-old Tony took part in a 10K charity fundraiser, and after a local news station picked up his story, the amount of money he raised for charity skyrocketed. Before this story ran, he had raised $4,000, which is actually incredibly impressive. But as of right now, he and his story have raised over $1.6 million. I'll link to the charity down below Below if you want to take part, but it is to help the Evelina London Children's Hospital. They're actually the same ones that helped Tony during his surgeries. And it's just a story that warms my heart. It shows that no matter your, your obstacles, no matter your age, you can do good, promote good, foster change. And finally, if you didn't see it, SpaceX's Dragon capsule splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico yesterday, safely returning to astronauts. And this is an incredibly notable feat. It's the first time in over a decade that astronauts took off from the United States and the first time ever that a private company managed to put people into orbit and then dock with the International Space Station. For many, this is the start of a new space race with private companies as Boeing is also building a capsule to transport astronauts. And of course, there are also hopes that this leap in production and tech might spur the development of other tech that will allow people to travel around the world super fast. And if you wanna see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about a fun little story that has some range. It's a story that covers why maybe some of the stuff you're ordering off of eBay and Etsy has been delayed and uh, a threat to the future of our democracy. You know, uh, fun stuff. So, you know, the, the feud with the post office is not a new thing. Republicans have long been trying to privatize the USPS. Trump has frequently tweeted his frustrations about it, but now it seems that his anger with the USPS is colliding with his frustrations with mail-in voting. But let's back up here because this story actually starts in mid-July. Back then, according to a Washington Post report, the USPS was told to make difficult changes that could delay the mail. With those changes notably coming from the new Postmaster General, Louis DeJoy, who is a Trump ally and a campaign mega donor that the president appointed back in May. That report saying DeJoy told employees that the agency would not survive unless it made difficult changes to cut costs. And among these new policies, you had things like overtime is prohibited. You also have limitations to park points, which is when a carrier parks a truck at the end of the street and then walks a few blocks to deliver. It's a very common technique technique for delivery. And on top of that, the USPS is also looking to cut transportation costs. You also had the Intercept reporting that not long after learning this, post office workers learned of another policy essentially aimed at having carriers deliver more mail in the morning by preventing them from sorting their mail in their offices before they go. With that report noting that this could actually delay mail from getting to its final destination by at least a day, if not longer. And while the memo outlining some of this says that it is to improve consistency in delivery time, we also saw the National President of the American Postal Workers Union telling the Intercept, these are changes aimed at changing the entire culture of USPS. 
USPS. Right, but with these changes, what we're ultimately seeing so far, more and more reports of letters and packages being delayed by as many as several days. With the Washington Post reporting that the Postal Service is experiencing days-long backlogs and adding, bins of mail ready for delivery are sitting in post offices because of scheduling and route changes. Without the ability to work overtime, workers say the logjam is worsening without an end in sight. And while that report is broad and it references these issues happening all over the country, we've also seen some more specific reports. For example, over the weekend, you had the Philadelphia Inquirer publishing a thorough article on what was happening there locally, with the outlet reporting that some residents have gone upwards of three weeks without packages and letters, leaving them without medication, paychecks, and bills. Also adding that local union leaders and carriers told them that the mail is piling up and offices unscanned and unsorted. And it's not just happening there. In New Jersey, for example, you had Representative Andy Kim writing a letter to DeJoy saying, while I understand the serious and ongoing financial challenges facing the USPS, I am gravely concerned that operational decisions that knowingly cause the USPS to fail to meet its own service delivery standards could cause catastrophic harm to many of my constituents and people all over the country. And adding, during the current coronavirus crisis, USPS postal workers have been the only reliable interaction for many of my constituents, particularly seniors. Noting that many of them need the USPS for their medications for cancer, diabetes, heart diseases, and other conditions that make it so they should not be leaving their homes right now. Right, so essentially asking DeJoy and the USPS to sort of analyze these rules and their impacts, and to also not just think about this in the context of the pandemic, but in context to the election as well. Right, because one of the biggest things here is November 3rd is coming up fast. And many are worried that these new changes with the USPS could have a serious impact on the general election. With people like Democratic Representative Bill Pascrell Jr. saying, with states now reliant on voting by mail to continue elections during the pandemic, the destabilizing of the post office is a direct attack on American democracy itself. It's also not just Democrats chiming in on this. You had Washington State's Republican Secretary of State, Kim Wyman, also hitting on similar points earlier this week, saying election officials are very concerned if the post office is reducing service that we will be able to get ballots to people in time. And the implications here would be massive for two main reasons. First of all, as Arthur Sackler, who runs the Coalition for a 21st Century Postal Service, explains, like any other mail, this could complicate what is already going to be a complicated process. A huge number of jurisdictions are totally inexperienced in vote by mail. They have never had the avalanche of interest that they have this year. Right, because of the pandemic and expanded vote by mail laws in most states, experts and election officials are expecting a massive increase in mail-in voting. And already, the, the primaries have shown that to be true. And unfortunately, in plenty of places, they have also shown that states are not equipped to deal with a massive increase. But that's not even the most concerning part. With these delays, there are a lot of worries that ballots will arrive after election day. And according to reports, there are laws in 34 states that invalidate ballots that arrive after election day. And that is especially concerning when it comes to swing states, because literally all swing states except North Carolina have those laws. And as Vanita Gupta, the CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, told The Post, in states where ballots won't count if they are received after election day, the impact could be devastating. Noting that could result in potentially hundreds of thousands of ballots getting rejected, and adding the delays are going to be unpredictable with the cuts being made on the Postal Service. That impact could turn a swing state completely. Right, so this is a situation that if it is not changed, will be a massive deal. Right, because of those new policies that were put into place by a Trump loyalist, as well as the fact that Trump himself has frequently attacked mail-in voting, oftentimes by making numerous false claims, a lot of experts have said that this move is clearly intentional. This including the likes of Wendy Fields, the executive director of the Democracy Initiative, a coalition of voting and civil rights groups who said, we have an underfunded state and local election system and a deliberate slowdown in the Postal Service. And adding that she believes that Trump is deliberately orchestrating suppression and using the post office as a tool to do it. Also, even though he didn't mention Trump directly, you had former President Barack Obama saying similar remarks while speaking at Representative John Lewis's funeral last week. But even as we sit here, there are those in power who are doing their darndest to discourage people from voting by closing polling locations and targeting minorities and students with restrictive ID laws and attacking our voting rights with surgical precision, even undermining the Postal Service in the run-up to an election that's going to be dependent on mail-in ballots so people don't get sick. But on the other side of this, USPS leadership has pushed back against these claims with a spokesperson telling reporters. To be clear, however, and despite any assertions to the contrary, we are not slowing down election mail or any other mail. Instead, we continue to employ a robust and proven process to ensure proper handling of all election mail consistent with our standards. But given the impact that we've seen already, there is a lot of doubt regarding that statement. Now, ultimately, that is where we are right now. As far as what happens next, a top Democratic lawyer did tell The Post that Democrats are litigating against these laws in every 
every swing state with an eye toward getting ballots counted that are postmarked before but arrive after election day. And while you do have the post speculating that the combination of you know these deadlines during a pandemic and the cutbacks made, it might help their case, it is still unclear what would actually happen. And then let's talk about the news around the coronavirus, starting with another disease, Jake Paul. So Jake Paul threw one of those pandemic parties that we talked about on previous shows. And since then he gave an interview to Insider where they asked him about his partying during the pandemic, among other things. And he said, I don't know what to think of it, to be honest. I don't think anyone really does. No one has answers. Our leadership is failing us and everyone kind of just doesn't know what to do. But I personally am not the type of person who's gonna sit around and not live my life. So, you know, actively throw parties where people without masks congregate very close to one another. And that makes sense because fuck everyone else. Also, side note, when I call Jake Paul a disease, I, I don't just mean because I think he's a bad person. Like I think the people that are throwing these parties are assholes. I think the people going to these parties are assholes. And with a large number of creators, if you think someone is an asshole, you're just like, well, I'm just not gonna support them. But the disease that is Jake Paul has spread in such a manner that even people who do not support him and maybe even actively hate him are helping him. For example, unless things have changed in the past year, every time you buy a piece of merchandise from a creator that sells through Fanjoy, you are also helping Jake Paul, as explained on his brother's podcast. Like one very successful thing that I, I built with the platform, like just initially like right off the bat was a, the company called Fanjoy with um alongside of of chris you, have you said CEO this have chris. you said this before have you have i don't you, think i have have really. you come out publicly and let people know that you built fanjoy with chris let me get this straight <laughs> when david dobrik sells a piece of merch you're technically getting a cut um i'm not no not per like fanjoy yeah but fanjoy. you own you have part equity of the company. in fanjoy yeah. yes <laughs> so it's building my equity. So technically, but. yeah. And that's also not the only one. He's an investor in Triller. There are other companies, but main point, disease. But hey, main point as it pertains to this story, once again, to the influencers who are really not doing anything with their influence other than being a bad example right now, I genuinely have zero empathy for you whatsoever if something bad happens to you and my heart goes out to those you may be affecting right now. Especially because this is happening at a time where you have the CDC saying there have been 4.6 million cases in the United States. In fact, in California, where a lot of these influencers are partying, California has now become the first individual state to exceed 500,000 cases and Nationally, we have 154,000 plus deaths. Now, as far as what doctors and experts from the coronavirus task force have said over the last few days, you're the likes of Dr. Deborah Burks telling CNN yesterday that we are in a new phase of the virus adding. But I wanna be very clear, what we're seeing today is different from March and April. It is extraordinarily widespread. It's into the rural as equal urban areas. And to everybody who lives in a rural area, you are not immune or protected from this virus. With her encouraging everyone to wear a mask, practice, social distancing, be strict about your hygiene, and even saying if you live in a multi-generational home, you should even wear a mask there to protect anyone who could be immunocompromised, like older parents or grandparents. And very notably here, those remarks actually came after Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi said that she had no confidence in Burks and her response to the virus, accusing her and Donald Trump of spreading COVID-19 misinformation. And this morning, we had Trump responding in a tweet calling Pelosi crazy and suggesting that, quote, in order to counter Nancy, Deborah took the bait and hit us. Pathetic. And Burks is not the only doctor Trump has taken aim at in the past couple of days. This weekend, he shared a clip of Dr. Anthony Fauci's hearing, specifically a part where he noted that when countries in Europe shut down, they shut down around 95% of the country. But in the United States, we shut down only 50%, which is why we haven't gone down from our spike in the same way. Which Trump tweeted wrong and continued to say our numbers were high because testing is high. Which of course is something that Donald Trump has repeated over and over, though it's been refuted by health experts. Right, the real number that matters when it comes to testing is the positivity rate. Right, when you go to the John Hopkins website, you check out a state like New York, you see the number of daily tests increasing, which theoretically should allow the state to know how to handle what's going on. But you look at the positivity rate and it has gone drastically down. But then you look at a state like Florida, you see the number of tests going up, but more importantly, you see the positivity rate going up. The positivity rate is showing the reason for concern and the failures that we've been witnessing. But that said, there's also arguably some good news coming from Dr. Fauci, who said that he is confident that there will be a vaccine for Americans in 2021 and adding that he is cautiously optimistic that we will have a vaccine by the end of this year and as we go into 2021. I don't think it's dreaming. I believe it's a reality and will be shown to be reality. Also saying, you know, not everyone is going to be able to get it right away. It'll have to be phased in. Though I will say there is actually some reason for concern here that some people might actively choose to not get this vaccine. We've seen more and more reports that it's not just your regular anti-vaxxers that are concerned about this one. This in part seeming 
going to stem from the expedited pace of this vaccine if it were to be done by then. Right? More people than usual of a mindset of, okay, I'll let other people try it and then I'll go through the door. But the, the last thing we're gonna talk about in regards to the coronavirus is this story out of Georgia where we saw a super spreading event at an overnight summer camp. Now this event actually happened back in June, but we are starting to see the reporting and the data. So at an overnight summer camp, 260 campers and staffers tested positive for COVID-19. And as the CDC broke it down, this is out of 597 people who were at the camp, meaning that 44% of the people who were there contracted the virus. It's also worth noting that the median age of the campers there was 12, the median age of the staff was 17. And according to NBC News, 231 of those 260 positive cases were for people aged 17 and under. But also this situation could actually be worse because according to the CDC, test results were only available for 344 people or 58% of the attendees. Right? And so this is an important story because there is this narrative right now that kids don't get the virus, which people are kind of relying on when it comes to the idea of reopening schools. Right? So you have people saying, well, that's not supported by this massive super spreading event. Now that said, looking into the specifics of this story, for what it's worth, it appears that there were safety measures that just weren't taken. For example, for some reason, only staff were required to wear masks. The campers were not. There were also no protocols for proper ventilation, like opening windows and doors. With the CDC also noting, this investigation adds to the body of evidence demonstrating that children of all ages are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection and, contrary to early reports, might play an important role in transmission. Which is why we've seen an increasing number of reports indicating that this could be a warning when it comes to opening schools in the fall. But ultimately, that is where we are with this story now. And I just want to pass the question off to you. I know we covered several different aspects to it, but any and all parts that you want to chime in on, I'd love to hear from you in those comments down below. And that is where I'm going to end today's show. As always, thanks for supporting these daily dives into the news, whether it be a like or maybe you share it on social media. Also, thanks again to RobinHoodPhil.com. Thank you for supporting today's show and hooking our viewers up when they sign up. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.